Thank you for joining us for Feed Your Faith this evening. I'm sorry I'm a little bit late. I was at the building. We're planning to starting to broadcast a new way, and we had some technical difficulties there, so I had to hurry back home and just now came in. Maybe a little bit breathless, but hopefully we'll be able to have a good study this evening. Thank you for joining us. We've talked about during this time of our studies how it is that we need to feed our faith, not our doubts. We need to understand that that faith is what is necessary for us. And we've looked at the last few weeks the point where our faith originates from God's Word. That point is made very clearly in, he, in Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So if we're going to gain faith, we have to study the word of God. We not only have to study it to know what it says, an intellectual knowledge is not enough of coming to faith. That faith trusts in what God says. It just doesn't just know what God says, understand it, but it's that which goes beyond that point of understanding and then having that trust that relies upon God that what he says is right. Indeed, as the Roman writer also points out, God is true, and let every man be a liar in the comparison to that, that we must trust what God has to say. In Proverbs chapter 3 and in verses 5 and 6, Solomon talks to us a bit about wisdom as he starts out in the first several, several chapters in a notable discussion of what is necessary in wisdom that is a wisdom given from God. And he says there, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. That's our desire in this is to look at God's will, to not rely upon self, but to rely upon God, to look at his word, let it guide us and keep us every step of the way. So if we're going to have that faith fed, that's going to come from God's word. It's going to look at God's word, keep in God's word, put that into our heart, into our life, into our soul, and cause us to live in a new way, even the point that we've raised the last couple of weeks, how it's pointed out very clearly that as we live by faith, Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, that comes from the faith of the gospel to our faith. And that just person then lives by faith, the faith founded on the word of God, and the faith which comes into the heart and overtakes us as the guidance system that leads us to what God would have us to be. We've also noted over these last few weeks how it is that some have a problem with doubt. And we understand the problem with doubt as we look in the scripture. We noted the fact that when the disciples of Jesus saw him walking on the water, they were afraid. Jesus told them it is I. Peter then asked to be able to walk out on the water to Jesus, and Jesus permits him to do so. As he was concentrating upon Jesus, as he was thinking of the fact that this one of power had given him that place, he was doing fine. But when he began to doubt, then he began to sink. And that was the point that Jesus asked him, why do you doubt? The manifestation of God's power was not what made him to doubt. Our doubts originate when we look at it. They come from our own thoughts. We gave an illustration, and I want to go on from there this evening and explore a little bit more. The illustration was of the case of Job. In his life, you remember, Job did not know what we are given in the very first chapter of that book. Job did not understand why he was made to suffer. And one day he lost all of his possessions. He lost his 10 children. Satan thought that would bring him to be one who cursed God. It did not. The next, he touched Job and his health. Boils came on. He was miserable in all of that. And what happened at that point was it was even to the case that Job's wife 
had no longer any faith and asked for her husband Job to give up his. It says, then Job arose tore his uh, robe and shaved his head and he fell to the ground and worshiped. And he said, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked shall I return. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. Then in the very next chapter, chapter two, in verse seven, so Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his feet to the crown of his head. And he took himself uh, to himself a potsherd with which to scrape himself while he sat in the midst of the ashes. Then his wife said to him, do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women. Shall we indeed accept good from God? And shall we not accept adversity? And all this, Job did not sin with his lips. When you look at these things, it's very obvious that Job did not know why this was happening. We know that Satan brought this, Job did not. Job's friends go on from that place and manifest even less faith than his wife did. They're charging Job with all kinds of sin and the wrong that is being done. They're charging him that you must be the worst sinner there ever was to have this kind of adversity. Job did not know why it came upon him, and yet still he did not charge God falsely. Did he question God? Did he have doubts? Yes, he did. And that is why he asked God for information what had happened. Job's friends were ones who listened to their doubts. Job did not. He was listening to facts. These friends are listening to what they think. And surely they ask, or they say to themselves, they've gotten this voice that was inward that told them these things. It did not. There was nothing of that from God. And so when you look at all of these things, they listen to their doubts. Job tried to ask God, why is it that I'm suffering? Why is this taking place? But he never got an answer. We're not told in the entire book that God ever told him who it was, Satan, that brought about this suffering and why it was that that was taking place. But God tells us that there's a reason. That reason is because we aren't given reasons for our suffering in this world. It may be that it comes from various places. There's some providential things that happen to cause us to be better as God would bring them about through his providence. There are some things evidently that Satan's able to do in touching our life. And there are some things that the book of Ecclesiastes talks about of time and chance happen to them all. I don't know which of those causes the problems or the good things in life, in my life. And you don't either. But when we look at Job, we see how he took suffering, how he learned from it. In the end, it gives us an exchange about God talking with Job. And as you look there in verse, or chapter 38 and following, you notice that discussion between the two. And God tells him, Job, do you know? And then he goes into a series of things in the world. Of course, Job did not know. He did not understand, him how, understand how things worked. And when he asked those questions, Job was unable to answer. But yet in the end, what happened was, knowing that God could answer those things that Job could not, caused him to grow in his faith. And it caused him to put his doubts in their proper place. Indeed, in Job chapter 40 and in verse 3, Then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer you? I lay my, head, or my hand over my mouth. Once I have spoken, but I will not answer. Yes, twice, but I will proceed no further. In essence, we would say, Job said, I'll just shut up. I'll be quiet because I don't know what I'm talking about. The difference between Job and God was manifest clearly. 
through the scripture, we understand the same thing. That as the heavens are higher than the earth, God says, so are my ways than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. We are not in the same place that God is. We look and we understand the various things of what God has done. And with that, we approach questions like, why is it that good people suffer? But sometimes those kind of doubts are put there as the focus. And people begin to have those doubts. It's not fair for righteous people to suffer. So if God's going to do that, I'm not going to believe in God. Or I'm going to question God or call God unjust. Job did not do that. Job asked. Job doubted about why this was happening, but he did not charge God with wrong. Well, what do we say when someone talks about why does God allow the righteous to suffer? Let me suggest something to you, that that's starting at the wrong place. What we need to do is go back and look at the thing to start with. In Romans chapter 9 and in verse 20, God points out the fact, who is it that says where you have the clay talking to the potter, and asking him, why did you make me this way? We all understand the humor of that. Be inappropriate. What the potter makes, he makes because he has the power. The clay didn't have any power. The clay was lesser in its nature. It's the tool that is there to be used by that potter to form exactly what he wanted it to be. And so it is with God. He is the potter and we are the clay. We let him take our life and mold it and use it as his will is. And understand he has that place or that right. That's the point that is being made in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 6. When you look at the idea of faith, it's the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. By faith, we believe that God framed the worlds by his word. Didn't come from the things that are made. He brought it out of nothing. And when we understand that he is the origin of everything, he brought it into place, then we understand here's the reality. You've got to have some explanation for this world. It could not have made itself. It could not have happened by just some random thing taking place and something comes from nothing. Something never comes from nothing. Nothing begets more nothing. But when you have everything that exists and not only all of the things that exist, but the order within this world, what do we recognize? That there must be a God that is behind that. So now what do we do? We look at that and we say, there's a, a sufficient amount of reason for me to believe in a creator. We talked about this months ago when we started this series, how in Romans chapter one, the apostle Paul points out that God's ability to judge the pagan world was just. That he gave them the everlasting power and divinity of God that was seen by the things that are made. Once I recognize that those things are made and they suggest there must be a maker, then I have a responsibility to look and see what would that maker have me to do? I recognize my subservience to him. And that brings us to the Bible. Because if there is a searching, God says, if you knock, it'll be opened up to you. You seek, you'll find. When we seek the will of God, we find only one book, only one message that's given to understand that who that God is and what he would have us to do. Only one book gives us that evidence, and that's the Bible. And as we look at the evidence and fulfill prophecy and various other things, we recognize, yes, that Bible is the word of God. Now, when I look at the questions of suffering, I don't start there. I go there after I've already established a foundation. The foundation is God exists and the Bible is his word. Now when I come to things that are there, now I look to God and to his word 
to give me the answer in all things. And so when I look at questioning, when someone comes along and they say, well, it's not fair for God to let the righteous suffer. That's them putting their self in the place of God. If I were God, I wouldn't do this, is what they're saying. But they aren't God. They're starting from the wrong place. They're looking from their doubts rather than looking from what we know, what the evidence is. You always start from what you know. Suppose you have a math problem to do. When you have a math problem to do, where are you going to start? You're going to start on what you know. And when you start with that, and then you work toward the things of what you do not know, you find out about that. But you look at the certain first. When you're looking at history and a chronology, what do you do? You look at what you know, and then you try to work in what you do not know. You start with facts and knowledge first, not doubts. And the same thing goes with us when we deal with God and his will. When we look at the idea of man's deeds, if I come along and say, well, if I'm a righteous man, if I'm a good man, then I deserve ease. Where does that come from? Why is it that that person would think I deserve something here if I've done these things? Let me tell you something. I deserve nothing and you deserve nothing. If I got what I deserved, it would be eternal death. Very clearly, the Roman writer said the wages of sin is death. Wages are what you get as a result of your worth. They, earn, they are earned by you from your work. When I look at my work, I've sinned. What I deserve is death. Thanks be to God that he doesn't give me exactly what I deserve. So it starts from a wrong place as well with regard to me deserving certain blessings that are there from God. But we also need to understand that it ignores the very benefits of suffering. There are none of us who've been through life who do not recognize that suffering has helped to make us who we are. When I was a young man and in school and in football, you went out and you worked out in Corpus Christi on August days of sweating and two-a-day practices. I tell you, that was a hard thing. But you know what happened? What happened in all of that is we learned during those hot days of August how to stick to it to where we could be there in the fourth quarter of a game. When you look at the idea of people enduring through hardships in school or sacrifice in an early part of a marriage so that they might be able to go on, many times what we see is those sacrifices and those, those times of suffering, when we look back on them, were great blessings to us. My wife and I, when we first started out as married, we didn't have money. We were in a place where my sister went home and told my mom they live in a dump. Well, I was very insulted about that, but looking back on it, I think she's probably right. But you know what? I love that dump, and so did Leslie, because that's our first home. We made it through that time, and it helped us to grow. And if I had my life to live over again, I'd live in the exact same place. The only thing I'd do is start it out and be willing to give my life to have even more problems that would be there if I could just have my Leslie with me through that time. Suffering, difficulties, trials, turmoil bring good in our lives. And the idea, why do the righteous suffer, ignores that point that there is good that comes from suffering. When we understand and accept God's place, then we see our place. That we are, as Job pointed out, to submit. Once he had spoken, twice he had tried, but he said, no more. I'm going to be silent. I'm going to shut up and let God do the work. 
because he recognized God was the one who knew best. We also see people sometimes on the other side of that. Why do the wicked prosper? Well, I want you to understand the fact that what we're looking at is the very same thing. We started at the wrong point. That's us as the clay asking the potter again, why did you make it to be this way? When what we need to recognize is, let's look to God in his word. Well, how do we do that? Same way as the last point we made. That we look at the word of God, seeing that God is, he made this world, he is the one who is the creator, and I look under the things that he gave, when I accept his justice, that's given by the evidence of his existence and the testimony that's given in the word of God, now what do I understand? I understand that's God's place to do those things. But I also see the other problem from what we're talking about of suffering. The blessings of the wicked do not negate the basis for the need of faith. When there are people who are out there prospering, who are wicked, so what? Does that mean God is unjust? No, it means somebody is prospering in this present world, in the physical world. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're right with God. In fact, it clearly does not. The fact is, we need to put God in his place rather than making us there. What we're saying is, if I were God, I wouldn't make a world like this. Well, guess what? I'm not God and you aren't either. So it doesn't matter what I would do. I need to recognize and learn that I need to serve God anyway. Just because somebody is being one who has material things that are there more than I do does not mean that they are blessed. Matter of fact, sometimes when you look at people who have very great amounts of material things, I say sometimes those people's blessings have become their curse. I don't know how many people I've seen that have been rich in this world in the physical things, and yet they've been miserable. Why? Because they've started to let that be their concentration. Just because they have things does not mean that God is blessing them. That may be the very thing that's bringing them down. It's based on a carnal view rather than a spiritual view. I do not gain the reward that God has in mind for me in this world. Those things are not the things that God wants. Those are the things that are merely through this world that I use to get through it. But the ultimate place that I want and you want, if you're a child of God, is a home in heaven. Our citizenship is not in this world. Philippians points out the fact that our citizenship is in heaven. If we look at heaven as our home, this world and the treasures of it don't mean anything. We're searching for that world beyond. In the end, I know one thing for sure, and that's that the wicked will be punished. In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10, that's what the Apostle Paul says, that each will receive their reward according to what they have done. The man is wicked and has done that which is of wickedness. There awaits him a punishment sure and certain. God is sure of that. I don't care if he's rich in this world. I wouldn't want to change, exchange that for heaven, would you? No matter how rich one might be, no matter how many material things they might be, that's only for this life. What God's preparing us for is a spiritual life and eternal life with him in glory. And that is the hope in the end that we look to as a reward. If we accept God's place as the lawgiver and judge, then what we understand is the need that we have to reverence and obey him. It's not ourself that determines what kind of world should this be. What would be just? Leave that to God. That's his place. Now what I do is understand his word is what I need to obey. And that word gives that very clear basis of judgment. John 12 and verse 48, we keep pointing out through this series that that word will judge us in the last day. 
My friend, let's accept that. That is God's standard for how we are to live. And then what will we do? We'll be doing just exactly what Solomon said. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. That's what we do. We feed our faith and we starve our doubts. We feed that faith by going to the word of God, seeing what it says, putting it into our life, and then the just living by that faith. That faith that comes from God's word is then put into practice, into action, and we live as those acceptable in God's sight. Let us always remember what our place in this world is. It isn't to question God. It isn't to let our doubts reign superior. It's to seek and find the God of heaven. Indeed, as Paul told those on the Areopagus in Athens in Acts 17, when we seek after him, we'll find that he's not very far from any one of us. My friend, he's as close as your Bible. He's as close in his speaking to you as his word. And he's given that in a way that you cannot miss it. If you want to know his will, Jesus said, knock, it'll be open. Seek, you'll find. Very clearly, the Apostle Paul had pointed out, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. God has communicated it. God has given evidence of it. God has maintained and given us the evidence every day as we look around at this world that there is an all-wise and all-powerful creator. Seek him, have faith in him, and recognize that my doubts are to be overcome by my faith in him. We'll talk more about our doubts and overcoming those next week, the Lord willing, ask you to join us again at 7 p.m. at that time for another uh, time of Feed Your Faith. We'll also be at the building at uh, 1017 Southwest 84th Street. If you'd like to join us on Wednesday evening, we'll have classes at 7 p.m. on Wednesday evening. In the adult class, we're in the book of Ecclesiastes in chapter five. We'd welcome you to join us there. Next Sunday, we'll meet again at 10 a.m. for worship service. Brother J.T. Carlson will be preaching for us at that time, and I know you'll be edified and encouraged if you'll be with us then. Please join us again. Thank you for being here tonight. May God bless you. Good night.